So it is my pleasure to announce the next speaker. Um, Amjad Masad is, the, is one of our portfolio company CEOs. He is um, the CEO and founder of Replit, which some of you might know and have used. Replit is one of the largest communities to get what's in your head when you want to write code up and actually running. Before Replit, um, uh, Amjad was employee number one at uh, Code Academy, was at Facebook, building some of the most prominent JavaScript tools that exist in this world. And uh, he is going to tell you a little bit more about his vision of a modern AI and developer-focused cloud, AI Dev Cloud. Please join me in, uh, in welcoming Amjad. All right. So um, when uh, Finod asked me to give, give this talk, I wanted to really you know, not pitch you and really have uh, extract some principles um, about how sort of Replit became you know, one of the more popular places to do AI development. Um, and so I thought you know, we start from, um, so I thought we'd start from some, some first principles. Like, so what is, like, what is AI, what does generative AI do to software? Um, and so I, I, one of the main insights we, we had at Replit you know, s since the start is that software is sort of like any other medium, like text, like music, like video. It follows the same sort of principles. It gets cheaper over time. Uh, people want to consume it in similar ways. People want to remix it. People want to share it. It's like fun to create. And so unsurprisingly, when generative AI became a thing, you could actually generate software in the same way you're generating uh, code and music and all sorts of other uh, media. Um, and so software is getting easier to make. Everyone is, is sort of noticing that. Uh, you know, GPT-4 is exceptionally good at generating code from very uh, you know, small amount of uh, natural language instru instructions. And so you can go from an idea to, to some kind of prototype in like mere minutes. Um, and so that, that means it's cheaper, it's faster to make, and as things get cheaper, typically demand go up, up to a certain point. And the demand for software is just, so far, it's been insatiable. Like, people just want more of it. Uh, a lot of it is running our lives. Um, generally, like, professionals are pr frustrated by their tools. Their tools are not really programmable. They have a lot of data to kind of uh, work with. And so, uh, you know, as, as software is getting cheaper, what we're seeing is that people want more of it. Um, and it, that also means there's like a massive expansion of what it means to be a developer, because that kind of reduces the barrier to, to, to entry. Um, it also makes it, like, uh, makes it really uh, uh, easy for people to do their own sort of software tasks. So you know, if, if there's one thing I, wanna, I want you to remember from this talk that I think is really valuable is software was bottlenecked by code. Right, we all talked about code. We all uh, thought about how, like, the hardest thing about software is producing good code. It's uh, it's about lines of code. Everything was about code and software. Uh, and so it, now that that like that really the hardest thing in software, the main bottleneck to software creation, is suddenly becoming easier. Suddenly, be, sort of in in a way going away. So now the bottleneck is a process. So the process of producing that software, going from that piece of code that, that's getting easier to generate to a thing that is running and is actually serving customers. So that thing in the middle, like what is that thing, uh, that, is, that, that is becoming the bottleneck. So here, here you have uh, you know, someone perhaps uh, uh, like you, sophisticated kind of individual with an idea. Uh, and typically, what do you, uh, after you have that idea, you find that sort of a team of developers, you know, or, or maybe you're a developer yourself, but there's some, some process there. You find these developers, 
uh, they write the, 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 that code and they push it to some development or testing or staging environment, uh, then that goes back to you. So you can see the result and you're like, no, this is not what I wanted. You go and you yell at your developers. And then that, 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 that kind of repeats for, for a while. And after a while, you get to a version that you're happy with. You deploy that and that goes to, the, to, to your end users. And your end users are not happy with it. They go and yell at the developers, and the developers kind of relay that feedback to you, and then that process, the entire process repeats. So it's a, even though this is a very simplified view of the process, that's already very, very complex. What we really want to get to is this. There, you have an idea. You push this idea to some cloud AI user's sort of magic box, and just the magic happens. Your idea is in production. Your idea is working. Users are getting value out of it. Developers are contributing to it. Developers are building on top of it. Uh, people are paying for it. And so th that's really what we want. All, this, uh, you know, all that extra steps, so we just want to box it into one place. And let's call it the AI cloud dev community. So the, the, really, the North Star, and this is a prototype we made with our mobile app. Uh, we we're actually going to launch this. Uh, but, but the idea is to speak software into existence. That's like the, the real end goal here. I don't think we're there yet. Um, you, you, can, you, can sort of, uh, you can get some really interesting toy examples. Like, so in this example, our team is generating a workout recorder app. Um, so you'll get to try this soon, but it, it's sort of like still more, more of a prototype, more of a dream, more of a like where we want to get to. Today, you know, like, what's like more realistic, what's like really happening is, you know, I, last week I was at uh, Craft Ventures AI Hackathon, and um, the, the, there was two tracks. There was a technical track and there was a non-technical track. And uh, Priya, uh, the winner uh, on the left here, um, she won the non-technical track um, uh, prize, and she's actually a product manager. And her software was more complicated and more technically impressive than all of the technical track altogether. She made the software that basically takes any sort of boring document and generates media around it, uh, text-to-speech, generate a character that you can interact with. It generates this like, very interactive experience around any sort of uh, born old document. Um, and that required creating this massive data pipeline and data transformation, going from multiple uh, language models, multiple APIs, and handling all sort of errors and edge cases to actually generating that final, final artifact. And uh, you know, I tweeted about it, and, and, you know, uh, and, and uh, that, that sort of went viral, because people are really inspired by this idea of like, non-technical people being able to produce a lot of software. So go going back to that diagram, you know, instead of you know, she's a PM at Microsoft, instead of having this intermediate uh, sort of uh, experience, she sort of cut out the middleman. And she just prompted the AIs, and the AIs helped her create that software. So, you know, as, as I start sort of extracting principles, and, you know, at Replit, we sort of, like, didn't go into a dark room somewhere and, like, design all of this. All of this happened organically. We were a little uh, early on, on AI and how it uh, could, could be generated. Some of it is happy accidents. But I tried to extract some principles about, like, what made it so that Replit was so well situ situated for this sort of AI uh, boom uh, and, and this uh, generative code uh, 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 sort of phenomena that we're seeing. The first principle is that environment should be a function of code. Kind of remember that quote that we talked about where the process becomes the bottleneck. Part of the process is to set up the development environment, set up the staging environment, set up the uh, deployment environment. And all of that is very laborious, very hard to manage. But instead, what if the environment is merely uh, uh, the function of your code, meaning you, you, you generate code from ChatGPT or Bard or whatever, you copy, you paste in some environment like Replit, and it just knows what needs to be done. It figures out what packages needs to be there, uh, it figures out what servers need to be spin up, it figures out all the configuration, and you just hit run, and the code runs. The second principle is the iteration needs to be super fast. Again, because code is easier to generate, the thing that gets in your way is like, how do you uh, deploy? How do you get feedback? How do you update that deploy? 
And then th th there's this, this idea of like the distinction between what is a user and what is a developer is changing. A lot of sort of AI apps uh, could be remixed, could be built upon, could be part of a uh, part of a pipeline. You can prompt a model in some way that other AI developers could use it. And so that interactions between what is an end user and what is a developer sort of starts blurring. And finally, composability is really interesting. The, the fun thing about LLMs today is that they sort of, sort of follow the, Linux, the Unix principle. So in Unix, you know, everything is text, right? Like you create these pipelines, and that was sort of the dream. But LLMs are actually that. Large language models are mostly like text models, and you can do a lot of these very interesting ways where you can like pipeline them together. And so um, th there's a coming world where uh, it, it's going to be uh, uh, it's going to be making software is going to be easier because these building blocks are available and you can build on top of them. So, you know, for, for those, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to give you an idea, like what is Replit? It's 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 a site you go to, or mobile app, um, and you just like uh, create a new environment in like seconds and and get started. Um, because we made it so easy, we, we have a lot of users. We have over 20, 20 million uh, users from all over the world. Um, you get your own computer in the cloud, and you get as many of them as you want, and you can develop on it, and you can deploy to a VM in the cloud. Um, we have a code assistant called uh, Copilot, uh, Ghostwriter, similar to Copilot. It is inline, and you can like interact with it in the same way that you, I'm sure you've seen Copilot. But also, we're not stopping there. We were the first to kind of release a chat GPT-like interaction inside the IDE. So you can talk to the AI as if you're sort of, uh, as if you're talking to a human. And it understands your code, and understands everything about the Replit environment. And it, it starts feeling like you're working with a, with a pair programmer. You can chat with it. You can work with it in the IDE. Where we're headed to, and you know, we have some, some upcoming, upcoming announcements here. Uh, uh, you know, uh, very soon in the next few weeks. But we want to get to a point where you can also sort of work with agents. So, you know, uh, you, you can sort of be in an environment uh, and you can talk to the AI and just say, I want to build X, Y, and Z in feature. And you can see the AI kind of try to get the first attempt at like building that feature for you. Uh, so we're going to leverage a lot of the things that make Replit great, like making it easy to fork different versions of, of Replit, the sandboxing and security aspect of Replit. And so like working with AI is going to feel like you're working with, with, the, with other humans. And, 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 and you, you're going to be able to command a lot of these, a lot of these AIs. So let's go back to the principles. So principle number one is the environment is a function of code. So here on the left, I asked ChatGPT, I could have asked Ghostwriter or any other AI to generate a website that generates a random cat. Um, and I literally took that, and I put it into Replit and hit run. I didn't do anything else. We figured out the packages, we run that thing, and we host that thing for you. The second principle around shipping, here I'm talking to Ghostwriter, I generate an app, uh, hit run, but then I want to create a release from that, and that should be one click. It should be very easy to, to go through that entire process, deploy an app, have that app running in production, and then, um, and then, and then you know, going and iterating on that app, and, and, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So you know, zero friction, one click uh, deployment. Um, this is what gets a little more interesting, uh, because Replit is now this, this community that has a lot of different users and a lot of developers. On the left-hand side is this uh, startup called Leap AI, and Leap AI creates the uh, this generative media based on uh, you know uh, facial features, like you can create your own sort of your own stable diffusion version, fine-tuned on your face, um, and uh, they launched on Replit. They built uh, a lot of their apps and infrastructure on Replit, and they also launched on Replit. And they immediately got users building on their platform on, on Replit. And again, this is you know, back to that diagram. You have an idea, you build that idea, but you ship that idea not just to, to your end users, but to a group of developers that could also uh, work on that idea, that could develop it, that could remix it. Uh, if you're a developer platform, that's, that works really well. 
Uh, the other one is a, is a tweet where someone is just saying that, you know, they prompted GPT-4 a few times, they generated an app, they put it on Replit, and they had 100 uh, paying users in a matter of four or five days. So really that cycle is becoming super, super fast. And like the moment someone has an idea, there's a uh, really quick path to making you, their, your first dollar to scaling your app and iterating from there. Um, and it you know, doesn't stop there, this idea of you know, being able to ship to, to a cloud that has the developers, end users, and collaborators. Here's a diagram. So we have this, we have this concept called bounties. So you can put up a bounty. You can, put, you can just say, I want, here's like $500. I want someone to build, um, to build me an app that, uh, that is like, uh, that's a chatbot that's fine-tuned on my blog. And like, in like, you know, uh, an hour, you're going to get five applications from our community. You pick one, and maybe in a day or two, you get your application back. So that's one way you could use bounties. Another way you could use bounties, and this is actually a diagram from one of our users, um, and what they're saying is that they, they get an idea, they hack on the idea, perhaps with a generative AI, they get you know, the first kind of piece of code from GPT-4, but they get stuck. You know, maybe they're not expert programmers. Uh, you know, maybe they're uh, uh, maybe they're working in a domain that they don't know much about. And so they put a bounty on whatever they get stuck on. So they get stuck on a feature or some problem or a bug. They put a bounty on that. The community, the kind of hive mind of the community, also powered by AI, maybe perhaps different AIs. And maybe in the future, the bounty hunters themselves are agents. Uh, so you could see a world where uh, like the developers in the community, you're not really interacting with uh, just humans. You're interacting with humans that are operating a lot of different agents. So uh, you put up this bounty to the community, and somehow it gets solved, it gets back to you, and that sort of cycle repeats. Um, and, and, and finally, you ship the, this thing on, on, on Replit, and perhaps you put another bounty for users to adopt it. You know, perhaps you built an API, and you want you know, someone to kind of build on that API. You can, uh, you can kind of bootstrap the adoption of your software uh, using bounty. So you know, I, I think you know, one of the insights we had is that um, software collaboration and developer platforms were sort of like, devoid of capitalism is that the, 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 uh, the currency on GitHub is stars. But you can't eat stars, right? So you need, you need to be able to transact using money. You know, money was invented to kind of as a, as, as a way to coordinate effort across a human society. And so we're really trying to inject uh, the concept of, um, you know, transactions and to lower the um, to, to lower the transaction costs so that people are actually collaborating with each other in a decentralized fashion. And again, when you do that, it really doesn't matter whether the, the thing you're working with is a, is a human or an AI or ultimately a cat with a neural link or something like that. Um, the, 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 the last principle here is, is, is composable. This is like a little more aspirational, but we have some ideas around how do you compose different prompts together? How do you compose different LLMs? How do you have LLMs that actually call into each other? Um, so w one thing we're trying to popularize at Replit is the idea of society of models. You know, there are companies that are really passionate about AGI. You have like this mega model, 10 trillion parameters, whatever. You ask it whatever you want, and it gives you an answer. The problem is that it's really expensive, it's really slow, the latency is really bad. Uh, the world we think we're headed to is in fact more of a world where there are gonna be a lot of different AI providers, there's gonna be a lot of open source AIs, and you're gonna be able to compose them in an environment like Replit uh, that, that makes the AIs kind of sort of, um, uh, uh, that, that creates products that people really love, that are fast and make less mistakes, because you can sort of uh, you can direct the query based on uh, the AI that's sort of like most competent at that uh, at that query. The Replit Ghostwriter product is an example of that. It's actually not one AI. We actually have. Uh, you know, four models that are interacting in different ways. The code complete model is a small three billion parameter model, state of the art code generation model that we trained from scratch. The Ghostwriter chat model uses a combination of Google and OpenAI, a lot of different things, depending on the sort of task that we're doing and which model is, is, is best. 
in, in the future, um, in sort of perhaps the short future, um, we, we want to get to a point where uh, Replit is also a place to fine tune, remix, and, and deploy models. Uh, you might have seen this new sort of thing that's happening in, in sort of the open source model world. Uh, you know, fine tuning became uh, sort of very easy and very cheap. You can fine tune via one API on Hugging Face. Uh, there's a, this very cheap way uh, of, of fine tuning. You don't need a lot of samples. A thousand samples, you can get a very interesting fine tuned, very interesting behavior out of a model. Uh, and these models are sort of remixable, and these data sets are shareable, and, and they follow the same principles as any software, right? Uh, so it's, it's sort of the software 2.0 vision of, of the future. Um, and the other thing about so, sort of currency and uh, like everything being monetizable, again, like this, um, you know, previously sort of c commercializing software was always this afterthought. Right, like you create something, you get a ton of GitHub stars, you go to the VCs, you tell them I have all these stars, you know, give me $100 million. I heard like 10,000 stars get you $200 million valuation these days. Um, and, and, um, uh, but, but instead, I, th I think that software should be inherently monetizable. And actually, if you embed that sort of logic into software, also, you could coordinate across uh, uh, people in a sort of decentralized fashion, but also across AIs, as AIs become more competent at making software. Um, and finally, you know, speaking of agents and agents that can do things, we think it's very early in the sort of agents. We think the hype is a little too much right now, but at some point, we're going to have agents that do really useful things, and we want to be able to, uh, for, for these agents to be able to do everything from creating software to deploying software to interacting with other agents. With that, I'll uh, take some questions. Got a question here? Hi. Great talk. Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering, when this becomes so accessible, anyone can become a creator. Doesn't that mean that there is a race to the bottom, that everyone builds software, the price drops and drops and drops? What does that mean? Because you also have to, sort of the counterpoint is software is by default monetizable. Yeah, so, so like before the, the printing press, the, the, the sort of the, the idea was that only the priests could, could read and, and write. And because, you know, th that way, you know, they could, uh, they could you know, t take a lot of money from, from people because they can interpret the word of God. And so we're in this, in this, uh, place right now with software where the priests are the kind of the software elite in, in Silicon Valley, and so I don't think it's a great place to be in. I, I, I do think that in a world where there's like a sort of a uh, in a world where software actually runs more and more of our lives, where AI is actually doing a lot more work, I think everyone to some extent is going to be a programmer. So I think it's an inevitability, um, and also like in the short term. Uh, there's going to be a lot of software jobs that are still kind of, um, you know, are not going to uh, follow the same trajectory, especially like systems level programming and, and the people that are making the AIs. But definitely, there's going to be, there's going to be, um, uh, like I, I think end user applications are going to be commoditized for sure. Othman. Thanks for the talk. It's uh, really exciting. I'm kind of curious how you think about um, what is needed to be able to, like I think right now, seeing the, these demos, et cetera, are great for um, brand new blank slate code bases. Uh, I'm curious how you think about what's needed if you take a large active code base that with a live system and where um, you, know, you can start plugging in more these generative models in the most uh, constructive way, like today and kind of where, how that trajectory goes? I, I actually think it's, it's, it's perhaps um, it, you know, uh, marginally more useful for old legacy code bases because a few things. One, the AI is actually very good at those because there's like a massive corpus of, of, of those kind of uh, applications and, and code ba bases. The, the other thing is that when you are a new developer joining a team with a very large code base, the first thing you do, and maybe the first year in some cases where it's like a very large code base, is building up context and understanding of, of the code. But instead, you're going to be able to just ask a chatbot. 
So you're going to be able to ask it, like, what does this code do? Help you navigate through the, uh, through the code base. Maybe act like a tutor to you as you're kind of thinking about the code base. So actually, I think it's going to be super valuable in terms of understanding uh, you know, very large legacy systems. Train a, a model on a new on an existing code base, or does that just be a context window? Yeah, yeah. So, so both. I think um, I think fine tuning on on code bases is is uh, is going to be a reality uh, pretty soon. Um, you, you can take our open source code model and like fine tune it in your code today, and I'll actually be uh, be doing really interesting things. So, I, I think both of them. Um, but, but but even just a larger context uh, window and, and prompt engineering gets you really far. One more. Um, we have one on the, I think it was first over there in the back. Um, I really liked your analogy about the priests and the printing press. And it, and it made me think uh, the Catholic Church didn't really take that challenge lying down. So I'm very curious what kind of uh, backlash or fight back uh, you yeah. expect to see. I mean, uh, go on any thread on, on Hacker News about Replit, and you can see the, the backlash already happening. Um, but but I, I also think there's like enough sort of energy uh, in 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 people um, th that previously were sort of excluded uh, f from that power that that we have we have we're win get, we're going to win this holy war so I'm confident of that. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Excellent.